Coleman. I'm the acting head of the School of Culture and Communication, um, but I'm actually a very direct colleague of Stephanie's. She's on my, um, she's in the program of English and Theatre Studies, so it's a great delight uh, for me to sort of open proceedings tonight. And I would like to open just by acknowledging uh, doing what we traditionally do at the university, which is to um, to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people who are the custodians of the land on which the Bayou and all the university sits. Um, that said, um, uh, my duty tonight, um, well I'd love to say a few little things about the book because I only got it yesterday and I've been reading the introduction and it's so Stephanie, it's that introduction <laughs> is written with such wit and panache and you can see the wit of the book just in the cover, it's just salaciously gorgeous. Um, <laughs> congratulations Stephanie, it's a really, really wonderful book. And as we all know, it's the teachers who influence us so much. And um, travelling down to, to Melbourne today from Canberra, I was starting to think of some of the teachers who taught both Stephanie and me and who certainly were a great influence on my life and who I still think very fondly of. Um, I mean, I think of Peter Steele, who as we all know is unfortunately very gravely ill and he's in all of our thoughts today. Um, Tom Dobson, Ian Maxwell. There might be some people here who still remember Ian Maxwell. Um, and George Russell. George Russell the man behind Piers Plowman. Now, you may recall that Clive James, that great raconteur, is actually on the public record um, talking about George Russell. And he says, and I quote, George Russell is a great teacher and I was the worst student that he ever had. <laughs> now, I don't normally disagree with Clive, but I do have, want to take issue with the second part of that statement. And I think it's the one and only area in which I can claim without reservation to compete with Clive James because um, George was a great teacher and he certainly brought Piers Plowman alive for me. Um, but I think I probably wasn't his most diligent student. Um, but look, quite seriously, thinking about George and Tom and Peter and the various other people who taught us, um, I started to think of some of the lessons that I learned when I was at this place. And I have a 19-year-old son who's about to start um, studying here next year. He's on a gap year this year. And um, I remember very well that I never took any of my father's advice when I headed to this place. <laughs> but I think the first lesson that I can learn or that I can share with you is that I should have spent more time in the Bayou Library. Um, but if anyone had said to me that with a Melbourne Arts degree I'd fall into the job as Usher of the Black Rod, um, <laughs> I would have thought that they had some explaining to do. And explaining something that I have to do when I hop into a cab, when I go to a barbecue, because there's that great Australian question of introduction. So, what do you do? <laughs> and it's a good question. Um, on my first day in the Senate, four years ago, I was ushered into the office of my new boss, and to be honest, one of my heroes, um, that great clerk of the Senate who you may have heard of, Harry Evans. Harry was one of the most outspoken Australians that we've had, and he's, he's a fabulous fellow. Um, he was then at the end of a four-decade career of service to the Senate and he'd spent half of it as the clerk and the government fixed that. They've now changed the law so he can only have a ten-year period because they don't like clerks being too outspoken. Um, but quite seriously, one of the fringe benefits of working in the Parliament is that it's a place where words matter and that's really important. And so on my first day, Harry looked at me and he said, two things you need to learn, Black Rod. Learn to say no to senators and don't worry about dressing up. Now, as it turns out, saying no to senators is not very easy, because as you'd expect, you, you want them to be pretty persuasive. But dressing up is another matter. Um, like most Australian blokes, you know, I never really paid much attention to sartorial matters, and you can probably see that still continues. But the thing that I just loved about Stephanie's book was that it basically takes us behind the modesty screen. 
if you think about it. Um, and it lets us analyse the layers of clothing and indeed lingerie that turn what might or might not have been, I think, what we'd nowadays call a wardrobe malfunction in the 14th century <laughs> into, this, into this sort of exclusive spectacle that we see now with ostrich feathers and cloaks and um, badges and so on at Windsor Castle. Um, very quickly, in my office is a photograph of one of my predecessors, a bloke called Robert Allison, and he's attired in what's called court dress. So he's holding the black rod, that's the stick. Um, he's wearing a frock coat. He's got knee-length breeches, black stockings, buckled shoes, leather gloves, lace cuffs, and best of all, this amazing um, lace jabbo. I mean, I complain about having to wear a tie. This thing is just, um, it's, we're talking peacock material here. Um, he's also got a sword. Now, I often talk to public, public servants and school students about the role of the Senate and, and what I do, and I show them that photograph, and I say, when do you think it was taken? Or when do you think he worked here? And people say, oh, 1950-something. And they're blown away when I tell them that he was Black Rod from 1984 to 2001, so modern times. And I'll let you into a little bit of secret Black Rod business. Um, one of his um, successors, who's one of my predecessors, used to let me into the secret that it took not one, not two, but three pairs of black stockings to hide his hairy legs. <laughs> so I, I think you can probably understand by, by the time that I met him, by the time that I met him, he was an ardent cyclist. <laughs> think about that. At least he had an excuse to shave his legs. Anyway, quite seriously, all this business about dressing up, and, and Harry was one of the key people who has saved me from having to do it, um, I think it, it leads us to one of the themes of Stephanie's book. It's not just about how history and literature converge in this notion that we keep reinventing ourselves, although I think we do, but I, I think we continue to reenact a script in what we'd like to think of the period costumes. And Australia's done some very interesting things in that regard. So as I was reading Stephanie's book, I kept thinking about that other medieval institution that keeps reinventing itself, the place where I work, Parliament. And I was thinking about all the kerfuffle we went through to get rid of wearing the stuff that I've just described to you, because it's now all safely down at Old Parliament House where there's the Museum of Australian Democracy. But very interesting, it's not quite as simple as the, it looks as if we got rid of it in 1996, but we didn't. Because if you stand outside the Senate chamber, there are all these photographs of the President of the Senate, going back to Richard Baker in 1901. And most of them are wearing these wonderful judicial wigs and lace and the jabbo and the, the whole kit and caboodle. But if you look at the third President of the Senate, Henry Turley from Queensland, he was a Labor Party Senator. And Labor Party Senators had a history of not wearing the gear, the clobber as we call it. Um, it's very interesting, just as an aside, my daughter um, got a poodle for Christmas, and I probably shouldn't say this, um, but every time I, s I walk past these photographs of these presidents in their, their wigs, I, I always think of my daughter's poodle, but anyway. Um, but it's very interesting because, as Stephanie reminds us in the book, a lot of what we consider the pomp and circumstance, and we've been through all that in the last week with the Queen's Jubilee, um, was actually sort of reinvented in late Victorian and Edwardian times. And yet, in Edwardian times in Australia in the Senate, Henry Turley was actually taking some of this stuff off. So it's very interesting. Um, look, very quickly, um, just a couple of other things. As we know, the Federal Parliament first sat here in my hometown, my spiritual home of Melbourne. Um, and one of my predecessors was a fellow called Robert Bronowski. And in 1927, they were packing all the tea chests to head up to this new place called Canberra. And he decided that if he was going to be the very model of a modern usher, he needed a black rod, he needed a stick. So he ordered one and he had it made in Sydney. Very interestingly, the parliament here in Victoria, when we handed it back to the state powers, their black rod didn't have a stick until 1954. Now we all know what happened in 1954, don't we? There was a certain royal visit. And one of the things that, that I thought of a couple of times reading Stephanie's book is that I suspect a number of crimes of invented traditions were committed in the 1950s. And I think, Deidre, there's a thesis topic there for someone to, <laughs> someone to do. I'll um, recruit instantly. <laughs> anyway, look, all this is a very discursive um, way of saying how much I've enjoyed Stephanie's book. And um, I was particularly interested when looking at the, the trials and tribulations of my predecessors with their stockings and their jabos. 
um, about, you know, should the garter be worn on the left arm, should it be worn on the, th God forbid, the thigh or whatever. Um, just very quickly, um, in, with the order of the garter, it's obviously different sovereigns and different monarchs played key roles. I mean, Edward III established the order. Thank you, Edward III. He also created my job, um, as Stephanie reminds us in the book. Uh, Walter Withers, or Whitehorse, 1361, he got 12 pence, or a bob a day, for <laughs> holding the stick at the ceremonies of the garter. Now, I'm negotiating an enterprise agreement with our staff back at the big house at the moment, and they all want a pay rise. And I haven't done the sums, but I bet there's somewhere on Google you can go that will convert a bob a day in 1361 <laughs> into, what it, into what it should be in 2012, because I think I'm being underpaid. But anyway. Um, look, the last, the other monarch who really stood is, is one of my favourites, because I think he's actually very misunderstood, and that's Henry VIII. And I, Stephanie, I was so pleased to use the Holborn um, sketch, because you know the one, Henry's standing like this, and someone else must have said this, but you know, because I'm not an art historian, but he really looks like he's got one foot in the Middle Ages and one foot in the modern, modern era. And come on, you know, I'm ready for everything. Um, Henry VIII, as we know from Stephanie's book, um, did a lot of work revising the statutes. Something I didn't know is that of all the autocrats, he's the one that had a black book. And, you know, you learn something new every day. But it was Henry VIII who actually did the transformation to make the Black Rod from being just an officer of the Order of the Garter to a parliamentary officer. He had a bit of a grand designs moment and decided he'd move out of Westminster up the road to Whitehall. But he left the usher at Westminster to keep an eye on these um, lords who had these sort of silly ideas about wanting to debate and discuss things. And that's why we still refer to it as the Palace of Westminster. And in the United Kingdom, the usher of the Black Rod is still appointed by the Sovereign. But from Henry VIII's time, the role became a parliamentary one. Of course, um, when I talk to school students, I always remind them about poor old Henry Norris, who was Black Rod in Henry VIII's time. He was a confidant of the king. He was also a confidant of Anne Boleyn. A bit of a problem there. Um, so he went, he's the only Black Rod in 600 years to be executed. So let that be a lesson. Um, I, think, I think in modern, you know, the way we'd explain it nowadays is we'd say he backed the wrong faction. But anyway. Um, look, this is a fabulous book and I, Stephanie sent me a copy a couple of weeks ago and I literally, as Michaela, my wife, will tell you, I literally couldn't, couldn't put it down. Um, so, I mean, as, as one of George Russell's, Russell's less than diligent students, even I can see that it's a work of serious scholarship, but it's also a fabulous read. So let me finish quite simply, and this is, this is where I launch, um, quite simply by saying that it's a shame I didn't study harder, spend more time in the Bailey, but Stephanie, it's a great honour to launch this fabulous book and the Parliamentary Library will be buying a copy. <laughs> <laughs> well done. That's exciting. That's, uh, thank you so much, Brian. That's just a lovely, a lovely way to get this book's career started. Um, and thank you especially also to Deirdre for welcoming us here. It's just lovely having this personal connection with Brian that loops around those however many years it was, as well as the centuries that trace his job back to the 1348, the key, the key year in this, in this book. I'm not going to speak for very long, um, people are standing up, but there are a few things that I want to say. Um, it was a very odd book to write, all books are odd to write, this was particularly odd. I didn't, I knew from the beginning what I didn't want it to be, I knew that it didn't want it to be a prosopographical study. I didn't want to write biographies of all the companions and orders, members of the Garter. I didn't want to examine all the voting papers, who'd voted for whom to be member, um, included in the order. I didn't want to look at all the statutes and the manuscript variations of all those statutes. There's a huge archive um, accruing around the Order of the Garter. I knew I didn't want to do that kind of book. And I didn't want to make it particularly celebratory. I'm interested in the Order of the Garter, but I didn't want to. There are a lot of books that are written from the inside, as it were. I didn't want to write that kind of book. It took a while to find that I was happier coming at it at odd angles, going around behind the official stories and really coming to embrace the sheer pleasure of this persistent myth of the garter in, in all its glorious vulgarity. The story, of course, the myth is that Edward III was dancing at a ball, a lady's garter <laughs> fell off, all the courtiers started to laugh at her embarrassment, whereupon he chivalrically leant to the floor, picked up the garter and tied it around his own leg, saying as he did so, on his soir qui mal pense, shamed be he who thinks evil of this, I will found a chivalric order in honour of this incident so glorious 
that all of you who are now laughing, unable to understand the graciousness of my actions, will want to join it. And so he did. <laughs> and that story is, is muchly, vastly disputed, but it persists. Every time it's a lovely story to tell, even those who don't believe it's the historical origins of the Autogata take pleasure in, in telling that story. And it's that pleasure that I really wanted to sort of to get at in, in this book. And so I find fascinating that even though this is one of, it's the highest chivalric order that's possible to be given, it's got the longest continuous history in Europe. And yet, nevertheless, that myth keeps coming back to the idea of female sexuality somehow at the heart of that, of that order. So it's that, that garter myth that is really the subject of this book, I suppose. It's one of those odd medieval survivals, the Order of the Garter, that generates this very elaborate ritual practice and a long cultural history ranging from the most high high cultural manifestations to quite vulgar songs and dances and beer coasters and, and all those kinds of things which all um, became the grist of the mill in this book. Overall I guess the book change, uh, traces the changing relationships between the medieval historical past and the changing nature of the way that we mythologise that past. So it's that movement between medieval and modern that's constantly shifting that is the order of the, the stuff of the book. People have asked me about the title. I'm describing it as a vulgar history in two main ways. First, in that it's a story about underwear, so how could, what could be more vulgar? That first story was recorded in the 15th century. By 16th century, it was being recorded in England as Farmer Vulgi, the tradition among the people. So it's already got the circulation as a popular myth. This is popular, popular culture, the popular behind the scenes story circulating about the official, about the official story. Whether it's true or not, I argue that this myth shapes our perceptions of the garter and the weird, wonderful ridiculousness of the medieval, as well as the ridiculousness of a lot of the pomp and ceremonial practice. And it's easy to write in Australia with that kind of attitude to, to that pomp. We kind of look on it admiringly, but also with a degree of suspicion, a kind of a healthy suspicion, if you like. And that's one of the, the angles that I've tried to develop in the book. But it's also vulgar as a history, in that it's neither continuous nor comprehensive. It doesn't, it doesn't examine that archive in tremendous detail. It moves back and forwards. It goes in and out of the official points of view. It loves silly stories. This book loves accidents. This book loves when things go wrong. In a recent <laughs> interview, Prince William commented of his grandparents, the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh. He said, one of the things I know that over the years they've loved is when things go wrong. They absolutely adore it because obviously everything always has to be right, but when things go wrong around them, they're the first people to laugh. And in a way, the whole Garter history is about things going wrong. So the myth is telling us the story about how the king rescues a social disaster, makes symbolic meaning, very powerful symbolic meaning, out of things going wrong, out of this amazing wardrobe malfunction, whether it's true or not. And this is the story that's embraced by popular culture and medievalism, this somewhat odd and quirky, vulgar history which has been a great pleasure to write. The thanks I must offer are legion. I've tried to do them in the acknowledgements, but a few people I would like to mention today. My dear colleagues in the English and Theatre program and more broadly the School of Culture and Communication. I'm very privileged to work at this university. I'm aware of that and I have some of the best colleagues it's possible to imagine. Um, and more recently, the ARC Centre of Excellence for the History of Emotions, and particularly Charles Seeker, who's become such a good colleague and close friend to me over the years. Some of our members of the centre are away, and some of them are dropping with flu, so they're not here, but I'm, I'm grateful for their companionship over the last year or so. I have a special debt to a particularly old community, the Medieval Round Table. We've been meeting on a first Monday of the month for about 15 years, possibly longer now, and they've provided tremendous intellectual companionship and friendship over the years. I'm very grateful to them for their constant support and friendship. And indeed to all who've patiently listened to drafts of this book over the years, including members of the Herald Society of Australia who are here tonight, some of the Friends of the Bayview, the Boo Book Club, and many other groups interstate and overseas. This is the delight in sharing one's solitary labours. And then with special help with this book, and again, some of these people are here tonight, it's lovely to see them, who've helped with research assistance, writing the index and so forth. Um, Melissa Rain, Helen Hickey, Philip Teal, Maria O'Dwyer, Anne McKendry, Rabana, Romana Byrne, and Sashi Nair. So thanks to all those people in particular. For a book that celebrates things going wrong, some things did go badly wrong in the writing of this book too. And I must offer special thanks to Suzanne Neal and Mitchell Chipman at the Breast Unit at Mercy Private, who saw me through some very dark times. But happier and warmer thanks to, to friends and family. And everybody in this room is a friend or part of my family or my colleagues, so it's just lovely to have everyone here. But special mention to Robin Eckersley and Peter Christoph and Eva Christoph, 
with whom we regularly celebrate the end of the working week in another old tradition of about 17 years. We think of Friday Night Pizza. I couldn't have done this book without them. Special thanks to Peter and apologies for not being able to use the alternative title for this book. Peter insisted I call it Snap. <laughs> but the press wasn't having it, so what can you do? <laughs> Um, warm thanks also to Jean and Graham James, who provided friendship and love and support over the years. Um, to my loving parents, Una and Wesley Trigg, and my dear sisters, Fiona and Jocelyn. Jocelyn's not here today, she's in London, but it's lovely to have her, her thoughts with me as well. This book is dedicated with love to two people. The first is Paul James. When I set the date for this book launch, I had a sudden thought, I thought, isn't that date familiar? And so indeed it is. It's our 18th wedding anniversary today. So, <laughs> so thank you, Paul, <laughs> for your friendship and love. And, and the other person to whom this book is dedicated is Joel Trigg, who um, he and Paul just make every day a delight to wake up in the day. So it's just thank you so much, my, my dear family. I'm just very proud to be able to stand here and thank everyone who's helped and been a part of this process. One more thing, as part of the tradition, has gone a little wrong tonight. That is, despite the best efforts of the co-op and the press, the copies haven't quite made it on time. Um, they're probably sitting on Tullamarine Airport now. Um, we hope they'll be here in a day or two. If you would like to buy a copy, Lauren has the order form and you can order it at the special press discount. Um, and if you would like to buy it, the books will be delivered free, I think, in a day or two, I hope. But in the meantime, thank you all very much for coming and special thanks to Brian and Deirdre. Thank you, everybody.